DC too, and everybody was half asleep. So I promise I'm not going to drone on for too long, and I'll try to be efficient about this. Uh, but if you do start to nod off, just let me know, and I'll pick up the pace a little bit. Um, you know, we've had a lot of great tech talks today, so it's always nice to bring in a bit of a softer side of the service and talk about something like information architecture. Um, I like to give a little bit of background on me for this, just so you have a clue about why you might want to listen to me for this. Uh, I'm wrapping up my graduate degree right now at Kent State, uh, actually in information architecture, which is kind of cool that we've gotten to this place in the digital landscape where we can actually get graduate degrees in this kind of a specialization. And I'm also the partner and director of products at Firefly out of Burnett, Virginia, which is a six-year-old 10-person agency. So we've been around for quite a while. Uh, what I do, my background is I'm actually a full-stack developer and a designer. Uh, with a psychology background, which comes back into play now. Um, I work across industries and markets, so I'm not specialized. I don't work in higher ed. Uh, we do see trends in the business, though. Asphalt right now is our big thing. So if you have questions about that, I can answer them. Uh, we work both at the corporate level, uh, all the way up from Fortune 500 down to mom and pop Main Street, um, and with nonprofits. So we get a nice intersection there as well uh, from a business perspective. Uh, we work in web and mobile, and I love a good pun. So if you have a bad joke, please stay after and tell it to me. <laughs> uh, in today's session, we're going to talk about Information Architecture 101. What is it? It's a big word. What does it actually mean? Uh, we're going to talk about the best practices when you're uh, going through an Information Architecture project, what to do when you get stuck. We're going to have a Q&A, and most importantly, a giveaway at the end, so I make sure you stay. <laughs> so Information Architecture 101. What does anybody think it is? What is IA? So structure. Uh, basically, how you your information to people in the context. Okay. Anybody else have any uh, guesses? Skeleton. Skeleton. I like that. That's a good one. Oh, very good. Um, so information architecture, the definition has changed over the years. Somehow this is, field has been around for 30 years. It came around in the early 90s and just kind of quietly existed for a couple of decades and then just kind of boomed. When it first hit the scene, um, it was about understanding and looking at the big picture of a product or an experience or a website. And then it was also about kind of the nitty gritty. And you'll see a repeated keyword in that second definition of systems uh, that's really important. But over the years, I kind of grew and modified into its contemporary version which has a bit more of a diverse definition set. Uh, we talk about things like organization, labeling, search, and navigation systems. Uh, we talk about the structural design of shared information, which is kind of an exciting phrase for me. Um, that it's an emerging discipline, which is interesting since it's been around for 30 years, but it's continuing to morph and evolve. So in some sense, it's still kind of new. And then the one that I personally use is the art and science of shaping information products and experiences to support usability and findability. So looking at where we've been and where we're at now, there's a bit of a shared ground. You know, we look at navigation and information organization and information relationships. That's never really changed. But now in the modern space, we're hooking into the strategy of a project. Uh, we're looking at goals, both from the business side and the user side. Um, and we're, we're working in tandem with content strategy, which is a question that, that we get a lot as IAs, is, is what's the overlap there? And there is. You know, there's that great saying about how you can't lead a horse to water. I like to modify that because one of my partners is a content strategist. I say my job as an IA is to get the horse to water. His job as a content strategist is to make that horse drink. And that's how the two work together. And then lastly, we're looking at architecting the entire structure of an experience. You know, before it was very much large level or nitty gritty. Now it's both. Start at the top and you work your way down. So the big, the big bonus that comes out of actually putting um, information architecture in your skill set or your knowledge base or as a part of your process really is alignment. And there are three different keys uh, of the alignment space where IA can really improve your products and your websites. The first one being users. You know, IA at its core is a subset of user experience design. So our first concern is the user. What, is, what are the user's goals in using a product or a website? And it's important to keep in mind that the goal and the task that follows are very different things. The goal is something that you want to achieve. I want to buy a new shirt. But then the task might be something more specific. It's something that you have to achieve in order to complete your goal. I need to find a black shirt. So there are two very different things that we, that we deal with as IAs. 
And then the information seeking behavior. This is probably one of my favorite things to deal with in the IA space is how people actually navigate and consume content. Are they searchers? What kind of searcher are they? We're gonna talk about that. Are they browsers? Are they somebody who comes into a website at its homepage? Do they come into a website from a referral and go directly to their content that they wanna to get to? We take all sorts of those um, context clues into the, uh, into the factoring experience. And then the overall experience, both from a business standpoint What's the ROI? That's everybody's number one question from a client perspective. If I'm going to spend X, what am I gonna get for it in return? From a user uh, perspective, if they want to buy that black shirt, for example, what are the steps that they think are realistic to take and complete that task and achieve that goal? But then lastly on that user side, kind of from a third party point of view, is the user's actual experience level. Is this somebody who's technologically savvy? Do they use apps? Do they have a lot of experience on the web? How do we need to target based on what they're capable of doing? Secondly, we have content alignment or context alignment. This is a pretty fun one because at our core, IAs are realists. We don't like surprises. Uh, we like clear roadmaps. We don't like um, speed bumps. We like everything to go really smoothly. So like I mentioned earlier, we look at things from a business goal perspective. What's the ROI on something? Um, how are we going to improve a brand, even though that's kind of an intangible? Um, funding, that's a big one, because as IAs, we do user research, so we need to know up front how much money is there, because if there's not a lot of cash or a lot of funding behind a project, we're not gonna plan a whole lot of user research for the basis for our strategy and recommendations. Politics are always an exciting one. Going back to that Fortune 500 and working at the corporate level, you have to be able to navigate those and to know what's a, what's a hot button for somebody. Um, as silly as it may seem, somebody may not like a specific word for a product, or they may have um, an internal culture there that's referred to a process or a product the same way for a very, very long time. And you might not be able to change that. And that's okay, because you have to pick the hills that you're gonna die on. Technology is a big one, because what IAs deal with a lot is structure. So somebody mentioned skeleton was a really good term with how we implement our recommendations affects the systems that they're run within. So technology is a huge component of a successful IA strategy because if we can do the research and make the recommendations, but if nobody can implement it, it's a waste of money. We go back to number one, business goals and funding. Resources, who's there to do the work? IA is really interesting because it's user focused and it's user centric. So if I started an IA project right now, most of the work is on y'all. And I like that. But I have to interpret the data then. I have to coordinate all the interviews with you. I have to run tests with each and every one of you. And that's a lot of idle time in my schedule. So we have to look at realistically who's gonna actually execute and who's gonna be the one responsible for making these recommendations. And then constraints. As I mentioned, these can come from business goals, these can come from funding, these can come from politics. But at our core, we're realists. So we like to know what we can't deal with. And then lastly in the alignment space is content. We look at audits quite a bit as IAs so we can establish a benchmark for how to move forward on a project. You know, one of the best things when you're trying to figure out how to architect and experience a website or a product, look at what, look what you've already got. The work's already gone into that. Hopefully you have Google Analytics or some other tracking metric on there uh, to evaluate what's already in place. But we also look at the types of content. WordPress is a great, um, system that supports this when we look at custom post types. Uh, you know, we, when we build um, products at Firefly, we very rarely use pages and posts by default. We are custom post types all the way uh, because it allows us to create really intricate relationships between those different types of content. And then lastly, the volume, which we're gonna get to here in just a second when we talk about the structure of a website. We have to know how much there's gonna be. <laughs> at the end of the day, I don't care what's on somebody's bio page but I need to know that that bio page needs to exist. If that's, again, from a cultural perspective or it's from a political perspective, again, I don't care if the CEO has a page on the website or not, but if he wants one or she wants one, by gosh, it's gonna be there, and I'm okay with that. So I really, it provides alignment in your products and your processes, um, which can kind of get overlooked. Uh, before we integrated it into our own process, there were, a lot of, there were a lot of moments of uncertainty as we would kind of go down the path of a project. 
Um, one in particular I can remember was a software company. And we got to the end of the project and all of a sudden we realized, huh, there are 600 resources on this website that we missed. <laughs> Crap. <laughs> what do you do with that? How do you, how do you get to the end of a six month process? And you've got this great, you know, 200 page website and then all of a sudden, oh, that's only a quarter of it. We don't have designs. We don't have a structure in place for that stuff. We don't have fields in there to define relationships to get from point A to point B. What do you do? So for a long time without IA, this is how I felt going through projects. <laughs> as you just sit there and just kind of wonder, where are we going to end up? I mean. We're planning as best we can, and I hope it ends up all right, but who knows? So looking at what IA is and the alignment that it can bring to a project or a process, let's look at some best practices that come out of IA. The two big things that I'm concerned with as an information architect is the structure of a website and the scheme of a website. First, we're going to talk about structures. Now, this may seem elementary. A lot of things in, in IA are very like, John, duh. Well, yeah, but when you know the context of them, you can really use them. So a structure is an organization to how you define the relationships between pieces of content. Couldn't be simpler. But that's a major component of how you build things. At Firefly, when we talk about products and websites, we have to talk in metaphors because you know nobody outside of this space understands what we do. So we always talk about building a house. Building a website is like building a house. So when we talk about structures, we begin to talk about what are the dimensions of that house? How wide is it? When we go back to the realist part, we can talk about, well, you can't build a site that's wider than your piece of land or deeper. So we can talk about constraints and, and the reality of it. I'm not concerned at this point of you want six bedrooms or three bathrooms. I just need to know how big that house is. How wide can it be? How deep can it be? How many floors is it going to have? Is there going to be a basement? The structural elements are what I'm concerned with. So when we look at structures, there are two major types. The first is hierarchical. Now we deal with this in WordPress all the time. Pages and taxonomies by default have a hierarchy. These are great because they're top down um, and they're search engine friendly because it allows there to actually be a hierarchy for, for the URLs and for the content. There are, there are drawbacks to these though. You can go too deep and too narrow when you're building a structure and all of a sudden your users find themselves in a rabbit hole that they can't get out of. We have a client that we work with. When we started with them, their website was 40 some thousand assets and 17 levels deep. Whoa. 17! <laughs> okay. Exactly. So there's another talk about maintaining and editing a website on the regular. Let's tie that one into this. <laughs> Talk about scope creep. How do you go from 17 to something that ideal, ideally should be one, two, or three levels deep? That's kind of a crapshoot. We didn't really know because, again, organizationally, that was going to be a really painful conversation, taking this much content and putting it into a smaller space because we knew product owners were going to get mad. We knew sales was going to get mad. We knew marketing was going to be concerned that their products weren't going to be portrayed in the best light, and then that's going to affect the brand. There were all of these hooks that were affected by this conversation. So we went to the data, because that was really the only objective place that we had to go. And we looked at where are people landing on this website? If they're coming in from Google, you know, are they getting straight to the page they want and then bouncing and going somewhere else? Are they hitting a category of product, for example, and then diving down into a product? Are they coming to the home page and then bouncing from the home page? Or are they actually following some sort of path from the home page to get to where they wanted to go? Those were all the sorts of things that we looked for within the analytics. And at the end of the day, we figured out five was a pretty good average for these folks. Now, it was painful <laughs> to go from 17 to five. It was a long, long, painful process. Um, in fact, our client <laughs> abandoned their audit in the middle of it and just said, just finish it. We're still kind of feeling the ramifications of that one, but that's neither here nor there. Um, so at the end of the day, we had to figure out how do, you, how do you reduce something, again, that was really narrow but also very deep and get it into something that was more balanced. And that's ultimately the challenge of a hierarchical relationship. 
they're kind of the default for everything, which is great because everybody's really familiar with them. But when you don't maintain them, they get out of hand. Now, Etsy's a really good example of this. Um, their structure follows their navigation pretty closely um, in that you can find a home and living page, you can find a home decor page, and you can find a wall decor page. Now, it's really interesting once you get to the product level of what happens to the URL, and we'll, we'll talk about that here in a little bit. But I always like Etsy as a, as a standout there. An example of what not to do. I want to repaint my house right now. I like Benjamin Moore paint, so I went to their website to try to find colors. I like historic colors, and they have historic American color collections. Great. I also like gray. You know what I can't do? I can't find historic colors and gray paint. I get this. Now, I have a design background, so I somewhat know the source of these colors and can kind of figure things out between a warm gray and a cool gray and a neutral gray. I don't want to do that. That's not my job as a consumer. They're a paint store. Show me the paint. Show me the paint that I want. So this is one of those instances where you can find yourself so deep in a rabbit hole, and as an end user, I get frustrated by that because they've gone narrow and they've gone deep, and I don't have a way to get out now. So shame on you, Benjamin Moore. <laughs> so on the flip side from the hierarchy is we have the database model. So again, in WordPress, we're all used to this because we use posts and we use tags, so everything's flat, which is great um, because it kind of gives priority to everything. You know, the bad side of that is there's that great old design phrase, when everything is bold, nothing <laughs> is. Um, so it's a bottom-up organization, and it relies on metadata. Now, I know there have been a lot of talks about search engine optimization. I'm not talking about SEO metadata. But I'm talking about actual metadata, so data about data. When we look at this kind of a presentation, we're typically talking about things like e-commerce sites and products, resource catalogs. You know, think of all the supporting documentation for, like, your dishwasher, for example, when you go to find... Um, a part number or instructional manual or, or whatnot with that. So we're thinking about things data-wise like colors, sizes, brands, part numbers, series, not title, description, keyword, open graph, things like that. The cool part about a database model, which is what Benjamin Moore would really uh, benefit from, is that you're able to re-pivot as a user. So if I'm on GE's website looking for a part number for my dishwasher, I can drill down to a certain point and I can go, oh, that's not actually the part that I need and I can go back up one level. <coughs> Database model lets us do that. We all, I presume, use Amazon. Um, Amazon's a great example of this. Etsy does this too in their URLs. Once you get to that product, you don't have a hierarchy anymore. It's .com slash product slug. It's right up front. Uh, there are deeper talks about SEO that I won't get into today um, about authority within a website and where does your content rank relative to everything else, yada, yada, yada. But at the end of the day, the big advantage of this is this is top level content on your website. And that's really the shining star and the shining moment of the database model. And again, you're able to introduce things through metadata like prime, colors, sizes, ratings that allow you to filter and repivot your experience. One of the great things about the hierarchical model and the database model, even though they're totally different, is they complement each other really well. If you've ever shopped for a TV, you've probably gone to like a Best Buy website, for example, and you go down, you go electronics, home and entertainment, TVs, probably Sony or another brand at that point, or possibly technology, is it LCD, LED, whatever. They do a great job because once you get to that point, they switch it up. So you've, your journey has been hierarchical, but once you get to that final view, they go, ah, oh, you think you know what you probably want, but I want to show you something else because I either have a better price or better product, or I'm going to make more money if you buy something else. So instead of just showing you Sony TVs at the end of that click path, they're, they're going to show you Sony TVs, but in that sidebar, they're also going to say, would you like to look at Samsung? How about an LG? And they're going to try to redirect you that way. So that's how you can use these things uh, in tandem to make a really robust experience. Now, the other side of the coin, other than a structure, is a scheme. So you know, when we go back to the house analogy, 
at this point, we know roughly the size of the house. We know how many floors are going to be there. And we know if it has a basement. Now it's time to answer the fun questions of how many bedrooms does it have? What about the bathrooms? Is there an open concept kitchen? These are the things that we begin to think about and consider as we build out our schemes. Now, schemes for the technical definition, how you are going to categorize your content and the various ways you'll create relationships between each piece. Pretty standard. There are a few different types. There's ambiguous, which is as generic as it gets. Um, they're really subjective, which means they're really, really easy for folks who aren't in the space to design. They're hard for us as IAs to design because all we think about is, what if I call this thing um, a random word that I know, but what if you don't know what that word means? And then what if it means something else to you and something else to you? And that creates confusion. So for IAs, these are terrible for us, but they're often the primary scheme of a website. When we look at ambiguous schemes, Starbucks is one of my favorite examples. So let's look at their primary navigation. Okay, coffee. Safe to say that we know what's under coffee. Tea, self-explanatory. Menu, all right. What about coffee house? What do y'all think's in that? Locations. Locations? What else? Interesting. Okay, events, community. Anything else that you think may be under that coffee house menu? In-store services, okay. Products, music. Oh, y'all are a much more informed audience than normal. <laughs> so my gut response to Coffee House is a store locator. That, that's what I think would be there. But when you open it up, you get information about Wi-Fi, because naturally that's the first thing that you think of. Starbucks Mobile. Well, you're already there, so why do you need the app? And then you get into Community. Then you get into store design, which really is that the top of what we need to learn on the Starbucks website. And my favorite is how they just give up at this point. And they just don't even know what else to talk about. So we get a great generic link, learn more. Learn more about what? <laughs> <laughs> about coffee house? Because I still don't know what it is. My Starbucks idea, my Starbucks idea is a better menu. Not to be confused with the other menu. Coffee House Facts, great, is the first one. What is it? Store Locator, finally. And then my favorite, looking for something else. Tivana Shaken Iced Tea Infusions. <laughs> it is the junk drawer navigation. It's exactly it. Now, I am sure that there is an IA or a content strategist or a digital manager at Starbucks, and this made 100% sense to them. I'm going to freaking clue what it means. Still don't get it. They just haven't had enough coffee. Exactly. Not enough coffee. It means they had their site already built and took all this to the and just put it at the end. There you go. It was already there. Didn't have the, and didn't have the political prowess to be able to change it. Yeah, so that's always a favorite example. But y'all knew that one more than most folks, so props to y'all. Um, so that's topic. So topic, it's ambiguous. It can mean a number of things. It's like when you put about us or contact. You have to slap some kind of a label on there, and for the most part, we all know what those mean. But the, muddy, the waters can get muddied. The second type of ambiguous scheme is task. Now, we saw this a lot when apps kind of came into power, because everything in an app is a task. Create an account, sign in, log out, share, et cetera, et cetera. As, as the web became more appish, this kind of bled over into the space. Again, Etsy has great IA, so I like to cite them a lot. Um, and in their top right corner, they have a task scheme. They've got sell on Etsy, register, log in, and cart. Now, the thing about tasks is you have to be really, really clear with them. There can be no ambiguity here. You can't be funny. You can't be humorous just for humorous sake. Um, you can't get creative. You need to be really explicit with people with what they're about to do. Because the challenging part about a task scheme is you're not just asking somebody to look at a link and decide, is that the content I want? There's a little bit of mental buy-in there. There's a difference between me saying, huh, I'd like to look at home and living products versus I want to sell on Etsy. 
there's a tiny bit of commitment there. So it's harder for us mentally to process. And as a result of that, when you're doing something like a task-based scheme, we like to limit it to four at the most. If you go beyond that, it gets really <laughs> overwhelming. Now, if you've ever been in an app, um, you expand the menu, and it's just, just vomit of links. It's overwhelming. You know, for the most part, we can navigate those when those are soft terms like menu, coffee house, coffee, or tea. But when it's sign in, create an account, reset your password, lost your password, can't remember your username, yada yada, that's exhausting to us mentally. So limit it to four. Um, and then lastly is audience. This is always a fun one that we see on higher ed websites. Uh, this is normally limited to like three or four on higher ed, but Virginia Tech takes it a little bit further and I really like it. Um, you know, they've got the standard of prospective students, graduate students, alumni, parents and families, faculty and staff. Their interesting addition is business and industry. So that's, it's an interesting way, because when you think about it, if you're looking for content on a website that's specific to a subgroup of people, if I'm, say when I was looking for my graduate degree, I was looking for clearly prospective student information. That's the keyword that I'm gonna look for. Now I know if I don't see prospective students, I can look for something like current students. I can look for something like alumni, because it's safe to say that those are always bundled together. So again, try not to muddy an audience with a task, with a topic. Try to keep really clear lines, because that helps folks learn how to find your content on your website better. Now on the opposite end of the spectrum, we had ambiguous schemes, which are generic, they're hard to design from an IA perspective. Then we have exact schemes. I love these, because they're objective. There's no room for error. Well, there's a lot of room for error, depending on who's implementing it. But in theory, there's no room for error. Developers love these because they're logical. I love to code them because they make sense. It's not a manual selection. It's sortable. I like that. Um, these are ideal for supporting navigation. So if we think back to the Starbucks example, if we went under uh, the coffee menu, it's safe to assume that they're either going to display all of their coffee products or product categories related to coffee. In either scenario, I can bet that that list is gonna be alphabetized because we're all looking for something specific as we browse through. If I'm looking for the details on the new blonde roast, I'm gonna be looking for bees. That's just the way that we're trained to think because we like to get more narrow as we navigate a product. So some of the examples on how you can implement an alphanumeric or an exact scheme are alphanumeric, chronological, and geological. Now back to the coffee and tea example, there's this website Steepster that sells tea. I've bought from it a few times. Their tea organization is interesting. You can sort it alphabetically by tea name, by company, you can sort it by popularity, what's trending, what's new, all these great different things. But when you look at popularity, sorry, when you look at the highest rated, it gets interesting. So how would y'all, looking at just that top row, presume that these T's are being sorted? What quantify popularity for me? Or highest rated? So out of 100, so we're going off of the numbers in the green boxes, okay? I think that's a safe first dimension. Now let's look at the groups within each number that are in the green boxes. So let's look at the 91s and the 90s. How are they organized after that? Well. Fractions of the, of the uh, green box numbers. <laughs> there you go. So that would be my assumption, is tasting notes are, are the way that it would go. So when we look at the 91s, the first one has 90 tasting notes and the next one has nine. Great, that supports our hypothesis. When you get to the 90s, the first one has 18 tasting notes and the second one has 20. <laughs> so who knows how these are organized? As an IA, that's a small detail that I pay attention to though, and I immediately distrust how they're ranking these teas. So from a developer standpoint though, when, when I have to implement something like this, I have to be really careful not to be lazy so things like this don't happen because it's easy to say, oh, here's a popularity scale, great, spit it out, move on. But what does it mean? If it's not consistent, what does it mean? 
Chronological is the, next, is the next exact scheme. We see these every day on news sites and on blogs. There's nothing um, fantastic or revolutionary to share with you about these. Um, just be consistent when you order things by date. If you're going to group them by weeks, group them by weeks. If you're going to group them by years, do it by years. Just keep a consistent path. And the last one is geographical. This is really interesting with the rise of e-commerce. The reason I chose Wegmans as an example is the closest Wegmans to me is an hour and a half away. So I searched for one, and I got the entire eastern seaboard. <laughs> I like Wegmans, not going to Ohio for it. <laughs> Not going to Georgia for it. Not happening. So you have to be really careful with the geographical because while that's great and it shows me what's closest to me, you have to have some kind of a scope on it or some kind of guardrail. Because again, when it just spits out everything at you, it becomes meaningless. It's just white noise at that point. Yeah, Road trip. exactly. Road trip to Wegmans. <laughs> we have uh, in our area where we are, we have a we have a local dairy that's kind of going east coast. They're from New York to lower Georgia right now, which is kind of cool to see. But they also have a locator on their website. So this was an issue that we ran into. Because how do you balance the spread of what stores to show where their products are when you've got such a large area to cover? There are a couple of different ways that you can approach it when you're dealing with a geographical scheme. The easiest, and my preference, Ask the user what the distance is. It's an easy solution. How far do you want to search? This can be distance. You can have a, a drop down for states if they're interested. If you're at the state level, if it's not quite all over, you know, you can do regional. So that's number one. But then the other one, again, going back to the reality of IAs, is knowing the politics of business because they sell to many different competing grocery stores. So our big grocery store in our area is Kroger, for example. We couldn't have their product locator just show Kroger results because just outside of the Kroger area is Kroger's competition. So we had to actually expand and kind of go beyond the traditional like 10 results per page so we could actually show a mix of retailers within their results because that was going to be a business issue for them. So it's small things like that that you have to consider when you do something like a geographical scheme. Now, search, I mentioned this earlier, you know, when folks search a site. Now, I don't specifically mean when they type something into the search bar, but rather when they're actually looking for something. So there are four main different types of search that you need to consider when you're talking about IA on a project. You've got known item searching, which is also known as focalized searching. So when I know I want a black shirt, this is how I'm going to go find that. There's a really interesting concept in psychology um, called the scent of information. And they actually call us informivores, which I kind of enjoy now. But it talks about how cognitively we hunt for information online just like we would forage for food. We kind of like sniff out little nuggets of information to lead us to where we want to be. It's really interesting. Way too deep for this talk. Um, but definitely look it up. It's really, really fun to read about. Uh, then you have exploratory searching. You know, when, when we go back to the shirt example, that's at a higher level. It's no longer, I want a black shirt. I want a shirt. I don't, I don't know. I don't know what shirt I want. I just know I need one. Then you have exhaustive searching. I want to see everything. I want to see every shirt that you sell. I have no quantifiers at this point. Not color, not size, not brand, not anything. And then you have the refinders, who are the folks that bookmark. One of the folks on our team refuses to buy a shirt unless it's on clearance. His bookmark list for shirts that he wants to buy is impressive at least. So he's that person that goes back every single day. I'm just like, you are skewing their Google Analytics so much. <laughs> you are hitting their website for like two seconds and bouncing. Stop it. Or actually do it more and then we can sell them our services, but then stop it. And then you have labeling. Again, when we talked about like ambiguous schemes, this is where you can really get into muddy waters. Uh, because what means something to one person may mean something else to someone different. Um, you have to have empathy for your users, again, because there may be uh, misunderstandings there. And, you know, be descriptive and don't be clever for the sake of being clever. I'm still going to hold on to Coffee House for quite a while as my example of, like, mm, not the best label. When you look at labels, you have things like contextual links, heading, navigation system choices, index terms, conographic links. It's, it's a bunch of jargon, descriptors at the end of the day. 
Chase is a, now I hate it visually. I'll just say that up front. I don't like it visually, but structurally from an IA standpoint, Chase does a really good job in their footer with their products index. They talk about very clearly with an introductory heading, what it is that they offer in this section. They offer you icons with a heading that goes with them so you can begin to learn the visual system. There was a talk earlier today about accessibility. Icons are one of the biggest pains in the butts that we run into when it comes to accessibility because you have to make sure that there's alt text. You have to make sure that there's a certain naming convention behind it if you're using something like an SVG that's more um, code-based in nature. But one of the ways that Chase gets around it is within their actual code structure, they're linking together that image with the descriptor that's right below it. So when something like a screen reader comes through and they see the icon for checking account, they know those are connected. So that's a really nice, um, again, not the best visual example, um, but a really nice example of how folks can use labels in a different uh, combination of ways to really express something clearly. So we talked a lot about how, how we got here, what do we do? Most importantly, what do you do when you get stuck? There's a lot in IA, so how do you move forward um, when you do have to deal with just not knowing what the next step is? And there's really two big methods in IA. Um, if you're stuck initially when you're trying to generate an architecture, or if you've got an architecture and you're not sure if it's very good, AKA when you go from 17 levels to five. So the first one that we're gonna look at is when you need to generate something to move forward. It's called a card sort. You can do this digitally, you can do this with index cards and go analog. Done it both ways, works fine. This is when you have no idea what your structure is. You have all your content, you have a list of your pages or assets or whatever they need to be, but you have no idea how to organize them. And that's okay, because at the end of the day, it's the users who need to tell you how to organize this information. There's a great article that goes into the deep, deep details of card sorting um, at usabilitygeek.com that y'all should definitely check out. Um, but I want to show you three different types of card sorting today, open, closed, and a hybrid approach. This is, uh, screenshots in this section are from a platform called Optimal Workshop. It's what I use. There are a lot out there. Look around for ones that you may be interested in price-wise or functionality-wise, uh, but it's no, by no means uh, an exhaustive moment uh, for the software. But this is what an open card sort looks like. You've got all of your content and resources over here in the left column. Uh, this was from uh, actually a crawl of WordCamp BC's website. And what you do is you ask somebody to organize things into buckets, but not just organize them, but also label them, which is the really important part of the open sort. So not only do you get a structure out of it, but you start to work on labeling. So you can avoid the ambiguity of, ooh, what's this all called? Now, if you're working with somebody, say that big corporation, who's a little bit more stringent on what things are called, you can do a closed sort instead, which is where you define the buckets yourself up front and you go ahead and label them. And then you ask folks to put all the content into those buckets. And then lastly, you can do a hybrid approach to where you can define some buckets, but still leave it open to interpretation if somebody's not quite sure where something might fit. This is my favorite approach because it allows your end client or the person that you're working with to have some sense of control but also allows the users to be expressive to say, oh, what I think goes in that bucket doesn't match up with what the client thinks, which is the great part of IA because it's not about what I think, it's about what your, your customers think. So it's a lot harder to fight with me about that. So at the end of a card sort, if you're doing it digitally, you get something like this. If you're doing it analog, when you have card A and card B kind of in the same bucket, you give them a point in this matrix. And what you end up with is what we call an affinity scale. So this one, this example was, uh, it was for a generic like brochure website, um, but the one that's in the top left ended up with a rank of 92, and that was the combination of a contact phone number and an email address to get help. Again, it's not rocket science. I think we would all assume that those two types of information would go together, but it sure is nice to have that data when somebody wants to fight with you later on about it. And then the flip side of that is tree testing. So if you already have a structure in place and you need to figure out, can people actually use this? You can do a tree test. So this is the reverse of a card sort that's focused on findability within, the, within a structure. Um, you use task-based scenarios for these. So if you remember when we go back to the context of a user, a user has a goal, I wanna buy a shirt, but then a user has a task, I wanna find a black shirt. 
So in this example, you've already bought your ticket but aren't sure where to stay. What's your next step? It presents the entire structure that you've already created and it asks users to go through and find what page or what module they think they're going to find the content they need. When you get through with a tree test, you can get really fancy graphics like this, which are cool to look at, not that useful, and really hard to explain. Especially when it's Yeah, exactly. So the more simplistic view is something like this. So if somebody is looking for where to stay on that task, we can look and we can go, OK, 43% of people overall succeeded with that task. That's eh, all right. But of those 43, an overwhelming majority of those, 29 as opposed to 17, found it on the first try. They didn't have to backtrack. So that's really interesting. And of the people who failed, well, they failed hard. The people who went directly to where they thought the content would be is almost four times the number of people who guessed around within that structure to figure out where they wanted to go. So this is a quick, easy way just to be able to say, Yes, the structure that I've come up with works, or no, there's a big gap here that we need to fill. Now, I've thrown a lot at you today. So I've got a, it was a TLDR, but one of, the, one of the folks that I work with suggested, since this is how to win at information architecture, that I change it to TLDW instead. So here to summarize is information architecture is the art and science of shaping information products and experiences to support usability and findability. Products are built on structures that can be hierarchical, polyhierarchical, flat, or a combination. Just don't use one inside of the other. Content inside of the structure can be organized via schemes that are ambiguous or exact. When you use one, try to use the other one to complement it. So go from generic to more specific. And when in doubt, test. Card sorting helps you define the structure itself while tree testing evaluates its navig navigability. Now, all that being said, and I know it's the end of the day, so I hesitate to ask this question, but are there any questions? <laughs> <laughs> Three in the front row already. One in the third. All right, start. Okay, so three slides back, I think it was? Uh-huh. Oh, no, right there. What numbers do you want to see where? Oh, it depends. I hate to say that, <laughs> but it depends. Um, I really, I personally, I like to see a success rate of at least 75% on a task to really consider it successful. Um, you can go the 66 route just to say, oh yeah, the majority of folks did it, but I like a strong commitment there. <laughs> There's always room for improvement. Um, and it, if, if you get something like 100, look at your task, because it's probably not right if it's that easy. And to, to go with that, mm -hmm. the fail rate, like what if you had a 74, You sure? Yeah. So like what if you have a task that fails? What, what, if, what if your success rate is relatively high, but your fail rate is uh, also relatively high? Like, but you wouldn't be able to do that because it's a 100% ratio. So the thing that, that makes me think of, say, say you have a task overall that's really successful, but your failures maybe has a high rate of direct failure, okay. but a low rate of indirect failure. Mm -hmm. That tells me that what you need is something more polyhierarchical to where content lives in one spot, but it's linked to from another spot. Whereas if you have still a high success rate, but a high indirect failure rate, people clearly cannot find what they're looking for. So that's something where you either need to reevaluate the task or the content itself. Mm -hmm. the, direct, <clears throat> the direct failures were potentially, I think I know where I'm going, and then it's wrong. Correct. Mm -hmm. there's something wrong in the test. I think so. <laughs> um, what do you normally see as far as if it's higher than 95%, it's probably wrong? 90 is normally that threshold for me. Okay. Um, anything that is grossly low, so 10 and below, 90 and up, mm -hmm. um, I try to throw out because they're just outliers within the overall kind of um, answer set, mm -hmm. um, and I don't want those to skew how this goes. And I also never want to give the expectation that what we have done 
and what is perfect. <laughs> Both selfishly from a business perspective because I want to resell them later, but also it's just not real. It's not real. Mm -hmm. I'm just not sure what, when you do this card testing, mm -hmm. this is a piece of software right that you're using to mm -hmm. do it, and you're sharing it with potential users or your personas. Mm -hmm. or Absolutely. So there are a couple different ways you can go about it. Um, if you're on low budget, Facebook's your friend. Mm -hmm. Get the link, send it out to everybody you know. And include some qualifiers in there like age, income, gender, other things that you might want to be able to filter on um, to get a more realistic sample within the larger population. If you've got a little bit more funding behind you and you're on a platform like Optimal Workshop, um, they have users that are pre-vetted that you can order for a couple of bucks per test. So that's pretty reasonable. Or if you've got a lot of money and you really, really, really need to match a customer demographic, um, you can go to a research house and actually buy a list that matches something specifically. Mm -hmm. So you spoke earlier about how you always use um, custom post types. Mm -hmm. Could you speak a little bit to uh, custom post types versus categorization type posts? Oh, gosh. Well, you know, the, for the custom post types versus categorization, um, I look at post types as, say we're working on um, a legal website, and we've got buckets like services, industries, and people. Um, at the end of the day, I know that each of those entities are going to want their own respective pages on the website, and I find that really hard to manage through something like a taxonomy. So I actually will create post types and then use those, this is gonna get really advanced for a second, so I apologize. And I actually use the post types as like kind of a faux taxonomy. So when I'm on an entry for a person, for example, I have a list of all of my services from the post types and I have a list of all of my industries from the post types. So I can really quickly say, John Doe works in industrial and um, he also does audits, just really quickly. Um, the other thing that I like about that is I find optimizing custom post types for search much, much easier uh, than optimizing taxonomy terms. Any other questions? Yes, uh, about scheming and teams. Yes. Uh, the most common thing that we see is like <coughs> alphabetical except we've got featured stuff up there that we want to we throw out at you first. And that's yep. I would consider that one, um, gosh, where you've got some, something that's like a sticky or a featured. I'd say overall that's still going to be an exact because 99% of the content on that page is going to be ordered by something other than that one. So I wouldn't let that one dictate the rest. Mm -hmm. yep. mm -hmm. Oops. There yeah, we go. So, one thing I've always wondered is that, because um, this is a very abstract concept, and um, some people literally do this in the back end with WordPress, with mm -hmm. internet pages and so on, um, but that doesn't necessarily have any relationship to the front end navigation. Right. I like to, because, you know, to me it makes more sense to everybody if the front end navigation matches that back end abstract, the abstract hierarchy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And in some ways, you don't have to have any of it at all. Mm -hmm. right? You don't have to have any kind of back end hierarchy yep. that shows up given if you have a, 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 an understandable front end. Absolutely. Um, so, if you'd asked me this question a couple of years ago, I would have said navigation and structure are one and the same, and they should mirror each other exactly. Um, I've learned over time that that can be incredibly tedious to do. Um, and it's not something that we talk to our clients about anymore. We actually specifically say that the structure of your website is not the navigation. Um, because not always are those top level items something that you want folks to be able to go to. 
Um, you know, if we go back to like the legal services website as an example, I don't necessarily need a page that shows every industry that that firm works in, if I can do that with a menu instead. So structurally, those pages are much higher in the overall hierarchy, which is great for search. Um, but we're not cluttering anything up with a generic page that ultimately is just links to deeper content. So that's kind of how we approach that. So it's not always a one-to-one. -one. So when you work with clients to develop mm -hmm. structure for the website, mm -hmm. Exactly. It's almost a way of prioritizing mm -hmm. organizing content. Yep. Exactly. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting point. And that you know, similar to the content in different areas mm -hmm. and the So, for example, on your um, university example, mm -hmm. the parents that a student might want to do, but the parents might also want to do as well. So you've got a single piece of structure that's used in multiple places in the mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, then you don't have to worry about canonicalization, which is very, very nice. That's a great point. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? I know it's the end of a long day. All right, the last thing I promised. So sorry to everybody who left. Give away. Who can be the first person to tell me what is something you're going to do as a result of what you've learned today. You, sir, get what is considered to be the good book of information architecture that has a lot of great insights in there and is a good read. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's the polar bear book. All right, well, y'all, if nobody else has any other questions, I've enjoyed y'all today. Uh, if you want a copy of the slides, I'm sure they'll be on the WordCamp site, but they're also at Firefly site at firefly.agency slash WC Raleigh. So thanks. Yay. From an IA standpoint. <laughs>